Let's roll in. All right. Oh, we are here for day two of our writing workshop. Thank you. All That's right. Two. We've got same faces rolling in. <laughs> um, and I see a, a PYP author's face. Yes. Hi, Mia. It's so nice to see you. Marlene's back. Samantha's back. Tom's back. Piero, did I say your name right? You're back. Nice. <laughs> they like it. Mm -mm. Nikki, we're having issues with the Facebook stream again for whatever reason. If you want to, when you have a moment, just pop a note in there for folks. It's live on YouTube, though, so we're in good shape there. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Lots of folks rolling in, as was the case yesterday. We're going to wait about five minutes to let everyone just kind of roll in, and then we'll get underway with our content. But while we're waiting those couple of minutes, if anyone wants to pop in the chat any I don't know, observation that may have occurred since yesterday, any new question that might have arisen. We'll hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end of the session. This is a kind of a, a heavier session of the days, in my opinion, just because target readers is just a, there's a lot of different ways to think about target readers. So we'll go into all that today, but we should have time for some Q&A. But uh, you know, curious for those that were here yesterday to kind of post in the comments, you know, any rewriting that you may have done around what your book is about, who you're writing it for, what the purpose was, and what your impact intended is. So if there's any any observations that you've had, please use the chat. More than I want to keep asking you to do that so that way you can keep refining it a little bit further. More of the same faces coming in. Marlene, Vicky, Jess, love it. Thank you for being brave and being on video. And as I mentioned yesterday, the video is not going, uh, does not go to our broadcast, just the slides are being broadcast out. Oh, Tom, I gave a good deal of thought to the audience and purpose before writing today and it helped guide me more. Awesome, that's awesome, Tom. That's the point, we're really focusing on the foundation in these, uh, these five days together. That is our intention here. And we, I don't know if we want to just show of hands or the little hand button, uh, if everyone got the recap email that was sent out yesterday that had kind of the links that we talked about. Okay, I'm seeing some no's. All right, we can look into that after, if not. Um, and we can also put a link in the chat box that has the, it's a replay link where it's just a page that has all the links and then you can actually watch from yesterday or today. So you're welcome to, or the following five days, you're welcome to check that out. Um, Vicki, look at you providing advice. I love it. Don't worry if you haven't nailed it after yesterday. So true. It's a work in progress. All right. Scholar did not see a recap email. All right. We will, we'll see what might be happening with that. It would be coming from us, not from Eventbrite. So if you register through Eventbrite or register through Zoom, it would be coming from us. So it could be in your spam. For whatever reason, I don't know why, but my emails end up in spam more often than I would appreciate. But we just got to roll with the technology that we have. Yesterday it made me thankful I decided to commit to taking this author lab. Awesome, Jasmine. That's fantastic. Well, Sandy, I'm working on a memoir. For some reason, it felt safer to limit my editor in the process. As such, I feel more open and vulnerable. Just trying to trust the process. Yes, Sandy, that is it is important to trust the process, even if you get mad at me for saying this at some point over the next few days. Vicky is cackling quite quite well over there because uh, that is a phrase that I've said to you way too many times in the last few years. Jen takes me out of my comfort zone every time I see her and I cringe and I love it because I grow, so. Just I think you. I love that you don't even secretly love it anymore. You just you're embracing it. There was one yep. time we were at a conference, and I made Vicky carry around a coffee mug that said "Ask me about my book," and that was uh, I could see the sheer panic and fear in her eyes. <laughs> uh, but you did it, and you got out of your comfort zone, right? That's what it's all about. And I love it, and I do it. I I use it when I write, and I am now referring to myself as an author, and that was so painful in the beginning, so. Mm -hmm. 
It's a journey Thank for all you. of us. You are very welcome, Vicki. You will always, and I appreciate you always showing up for things. It's a, it's, it's nice to always see your face and I always call you out. So <laughs> it's perfect. It's a win-win. All right. So we are at our five minute mark. I know there's people coming and going and I'm sure that will continue, but I will, for the sake of everyone who is here in a timely fashion, get rolling with our, our conversation today. So we're going to be talking about target readers, but before we get there, we're just going to do a little bit of a recap. And I don't need to repeat all of these things verbatim, but just a reminder, participation I find is just really valuable and helpful throughout this process. So please participate as much or as little as you would like. Ask your questions. I know uh, Nikki and I both observed that someone was asking about uh, writer's block yesterday in the chat. So I wanna make sure that we acknowledge that question at some point toward the end. And so we're gonna try to do a little bit better of a job um, getting to your questions as we're kind of going through this process. And when it comes to target readers, I feel like a lot of questions tend to emerge. So I, we're, we're willing and prepared to answer whatever comes up. Mm -hmm. And Nikki has already posted in the chat the link to the replay. So if anyone needs to touch base on what happened yesterday, it's going to be the same page. All the all the videos will be linked there at the same at the same place. And then just a reminder for those who are just coming today for the first time, because there's definitely some new names that were not here yesterday. So I'm Jen Grace. I am the founder of Publish Your Purpose, and I am with Nikki Garcia, who is our director of operations and. Uh, an unofficial co-founder of PYP from back in 2015. Uh, at some point, we just need to make that official. And we'll be kind of monitoring the chat and the comments today. So if there's anything that you want to make sure she sees, feel free to like directly message her. Um, otherwise, we'll both mm -hmm. be kind of uh, monitoring the comments as best as we can. Mm -hmm. All right. At the top of the hour, I would like to start off with the good news, Jen, and um, announce the book winner from yesterday and remind everyone that they too have a chance to win a copy of a signed copy of your book no less today. We sure can. And the winner is in the waiting room right now. So we should. Oh, wait. we should let them in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Let's On it. Let's let, and I don't want to say their name wrong. Do we need to apply every day for the giveaway? Yes, Esther. Please do. So we're picking kind of based on who's here live. We're pulling from uh, from those who are here live for the for the signed special edition book giveaway. So and I'll drop the link again. Amazing. So our winner. I have it on a slide later, but I think starting us off here is a great idea, and we'll do that oh, tomorrow. Sorry. So. <laughs> it's fine. We're fine. <laughs> um, so is it Lolly Loli Santiago? L O L I. How are, can you, how do you say your name? Hi, Loli. Loli, perfect. You are, you are our first book giveaway winner. So we'll be, ah! yes, yeah. we'll be in contact asking for your mailing address so we can sign, uh, send out a signed copy to you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, you your, your timing was perfect. We were just like, we'll announce the winner and you were in the waiting room. So perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. So the book giveaway, I'll have that slide up later, but I know Nikki dropped the link in there. If you want to throw your hat in the ring for it, Please, by all means, do. We're picking a complete random, and uh, we'll be giving away one book each day this week. Okay, so we already kind of know what's coming over the five days from yesterday, but for everyone who was not here yesterday, just to kind of quick recap, yesterday was purpose, vision, impact, really kind of thinking about what that looks like. Today's target readership, target readers are a very important part of this process both from a writing standpoint and then also a marketing standpoint. So we're gonna cover both of those things as we proceed. And then the power of free writing and, and breaking down your process into manageable steps from a writing standpoint, this will be the foundational point. So it's very intentionally in day three. This will be, will be homework after tomorrow. I think homework today too, again, use the workbook, cannot emphasize that enough, but this uh, tomorrow will be kind of our foundation that we'll build on in day four, which is actually creating a timeline and like really building that foundation. And then we're going to talk about managing the unexpected, which is just when life happens, how do we have a plan for it? So that way it doesn't derail us. Very, very kind of basic here from a, obviously a writing and author standpoint. All right. So we want to make sure that we are aware of downloading the workbook. So if you haven't already, actually, for those that I can actually see on the screen, who, 
who downloaded the workbook, made a copy of it, did anything with it. All right, all right, overachievers, I like it. Yes, Samantha's got it printed out in front of her. Yes, I love it. So does Lolly, it looks like. Yes. Okay, good, good. That is that is my hope, is that it just becomes a useful tool and resource to all of you. And Sharon is saying that, yes, it is open now. Perfection. So if you have not already, oops, what have I done? Oh, no. Okay, I feel like I'm, I messed up my slides. Uh, that is the link to it, and we'll put that in the chat as well. All right. We don't need the warning. You already had the warning. Um, hold on. Am I on? Good grief. Hold on a second. You know, see me in, in full glory for a second here. Hold on. The slides are in the wrong place. This is the joy of technology, folks. We see your about me slide right now. Is that the, not the one you want? That is not the one, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wah, wah. All right, hold on one second. Well, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. Let's see. Good grief. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you all for being patient. All right, let's resume share and see if you now see a slide that says target reader. Do we? Yes. Okay. Amazing. All right. You know what? We can't be perfect at everything. Technology is not always my friend. Just have to own it. All right. So again, yesterday we kind of talked about your impact, your purpose. If anyone wants to kind of share what their statement was, please, by all means, do it in the chat. Even if, you know, like we're all reading the comments, like Nikki and I are reading the comments after the fact, but if there's you just want to kind of express that your excitement because you found a different way to think about it or reframe it or whatever that might look like, please use the chat because it just adds a little extra sense of accountability. And that is ultimately kind of the, the goal that we are after. So target readers, target readers are, are a big kind of piece of this process. So again, using the chat, I would love to know who feels like they have a good sense of who their target reader is. Just uh, maybe on a scale of one to five, one being, you have no idea five feeling like you, you you really have it nailed. Let's see, threes, fours, people in the middle, baseline two, four, 5.5. Ooh, I like that. That's impressive. <laughs> Overachievers, I love it. Fours, fives. Oh, this is awesome. This is good. <laughs> After yesterday, I don't think I do anymore. <laughs> All right, we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Fours, mm -hmm. fives. Oh, this is fantastic. All right. So for those of you who have thought about their target readers and are like, I'm on it. Anyone, all of you, whomever has said five or 5.5, drop in the chat who you're writing this book for. Like who is your target reader? Just however you wanna describe that person. And then we're gonna, we're gonna dissect and go through this. Marlene's still not clear, that's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna get there. Young adults, Isabella's saying. I feel like there are two types of readers, people who are questioning their gender and people who want to be allies. Emerging to senior company leaders, women, me 15 years ago, that is very common, where it's like you at a, at a different place in your life. White men who want or need to get more comfortable with DEI. These are answers that are helping me tremendously because we're going to dissect this very deeply right now. Newly promoted or transferred managers, especially women of color. Sandy's saying, I like the me of 15 years ago. Absolutely. Adult women. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. So what I am noticing out of most of the responses here is they're based on demographic data points. So a woman, that's a, a demographic data point. Uh, you from 15 years ago, there's not a lot of quantifying what that actually means. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna break down four different ways we can think about who our target reader is. Oops, chat is in the way. We're gonna talk about geographic, demographic, where are we going? Psychographic and behavioral. Curious, out of these options, who here has, feels like they know what even what i mean by this like somebody in the chat 
define what I mean by any of these geographic, demographic, psychographic, behavioral, just, you know, whatever, whatever definition feels right and makes sense to you. Women in the Northeast of the country that are stable and <laughs> willing to grow and are putting in the work to become better humans. That is nice, Jess. That is <laughs> that is much better than just saying women or even women in the Northeast, right? So we wanna think how, how can we go deeper in who we're writing for? Because the benefit of how, of the benefit of knowing this information is that it helps us define who our target reader is in really deep detail. So it both from a writing standpoint and a marketing standpoint, because when we know exactly who we're writing for, our stories become more clear. Our story arc becomes more clear. Our lessons learned become more clear. Whatever we're trying to teach to somebody becomes more clear. So Sharon is saying, geo is location, demo, characteristics, and polling, psycho, motivations, behavioral things they align with. Yeah, you're definitely right on, right on the right track. So we're gonna break down all four, all four of these buckets today. And as you are identifying Good, Edgar, you don't understand psychographic? That's fine, we're gonna talk about it in a little bit. So I'm gonna start with the easy one. I think geographic tends to be, I think geographic and demographic tend to be the, the easier of the two. But we're not just necessarily thinking about an exact location. There's a couple of things that we can be thinking about as well. And the caveat I will put out here for all of these things is, some of these will not apply to what you are working on and that is okay. So if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't resonate, for any reason, you're like, I don't think this works for me. It probably doesn't, and that's perfectly fine. And if you want to brainstorm about it later, we can absolutely do that too. Okay, so geographic. Thinking about where do potential readers live? So it's now, before, what languages, what region, what country? Again, for some of you, this is relevant. For others, it may not be relevant. Climate, seasons, is that relevant? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And these, I'm just pulling a small selection of how we could define this. There's a lot of other ways that these, these there's more things that can be put into this bucket. Urban, suburban environments might, might be relevant, may not be relevant. We can throw a rural environment in there. Maybe relevant, may not be. Oops. Any other things coming up for people that you feel like, would that be geographic or is that not geographic? Feel free to you know, kind of chime in. I feel, again, I think this is kind of like the easier one. Like I, if I think about my book that I published in October, which is a book about writing and publishing, for me, the geography doesn't really matter too much. The most important part about the geography is the fact that it's in English. So there's no translated version available. That's like the, the most, that's probably the thing that is most relevant from all of this. For when it comes to stories and someone wanting to share their story, like all of you, where you're located, what climate you're in, none of that really matters. But for some of you, it might really matter. Cultural norms, Carlton, that's a good one. Everyone feel like they have a kind of a, a sense of what, what ge uh, geographic, uh, when you suggest season, is that weather or seasonality? It could be both. Could be both. So, you know, it could be looking at, does someone celebrate Christmas? That can actually fall into other buckets, not just that can fall into a behavioral bu the bucket as well as a geographic bucket. Tom, red or blue states, coast versus middle America. Absolutely. These are all things that could be relevant to someone's book, but not to someone else's book. So I like to start with the easy one because I feel like, you know, it's a little bit easier to kind of wrap your head around. So if you have your workbook in front of you, Jot in anything that you're thinking of right now that might feel like it's relevant to what you're writing about. Just kind of like take a moment. That way you don't have to come back and do this later. Although if you want to come back and explore this later, you are welcome to. It's interesting because we have a writing program that's a six-month program that uh, Vicki has had the, the joy of being in. And I've had the joy of uh, uh, working <laughs> alongside of her and calling you out all the time. And in that program, what someone kind of starts with what they think something is versus what it actually turns into in the middle of the process versus what it turns into in the end of the process are oftentimes dramatically different from one another. 
sometimes they're they're just kind of refining it a little bit further. So sometimes it's like, I really know who I'm writing for. And now I have a little more clarity on that. And it's going to make this easier. Other times it is a complete 180 for who you thought you were writing for versus who you actually are writing for. There's nothing, there's no right or wrong in that. It's just kind of part of this process, which is why I use the phrase, trust the process, because it's going to help you get to closer to what you're trying to get to. All right, Sandy's got- and Sometimes you've been writing for a year and you go, no, that's not right. <laughs> um, let me try this again. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We all have to just kind of find our own groove and, you know, and for some of us just kind of writing it in a silo and just kind of like cranking through and getting it done works great for others of us we kind of like a community and in a supportive environment to make it happen so it really just comes down to kind of knowing who you are and where you what type of support and systems you need in place does world building fall under geo hmm. i don't know i need to know more of how you're defining that to be able to answer that uh, let's see, Sandy is saying 19 to 30 year old suburban moms who were raised fundamental Christian but had expanded their worldview. They see their role as a mom as a primary role and parent with much intentionality as they can muster. They are starting to question how their child fits into the gender norms and are faced with raising a child on the LGBTQ spectrum. Sandy, that is perfection. That is super, super clear and concise. And this is going to bring us into some of the other kind of pieces. And I love already that there's kind of some overlap in the in what people are writing about. Tom, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, one thing I've struggled with is like I, I feel like we're supposed to hone it in, but then it feels like it limits like who you'd like it to be open to, right? Like people who think similar to me, but what if I want to change the minds of others, which is very different demographics or audiences. So like even when trying to write, but trying to write with people who might already be further down the line in terms of shared beliefs versus being there for people who might be at the very beginning stages. So I kind of struggle with this part. You are not alone. And it could, like, that could be something that is two separate books where you have something that here's the primer for someone who's just starting out on the journey of whatever the thing is that people are writing about. And then here's the advanced strategies of what someone might be writing about. What we can do to kind of find the balance between those two things is I always think of the choose your own venture books from like the eighties and nineties. We have a number of books that have done this very successfully where you basically have, here's the, here's the overall content that applies to everybody. And then here's the choose your own adventure portion within the chapter. That's like, Hey, if you are just starting out, these next pages are going to be relevant to you. If you are more of an advanced person in this and you're just looking for some new tips and tricks, you might want to skip over to these pages. And so the important thing is kind of writing for the collective first of the commonality that those two audiences might have and then going deeper. And then we can get really creative from an interior layout standpoint where we have a, a number of books that do this. We have one that came out in, uh, in the fall that was about LinkedIn and it was kind of like the novice LinkedIn user versus an expert LinkedIn user and then like the people in between like the intermediate. And so we created icons. So that way when someone's going through and they're trying to figure out how can they enhance their LinkedIn presence, anyone who already feels like they're an intermediate can just immediately go and visually see those icons and say, that's for me, I can just ignore the beginner piece of it. And so it allows for the reader to kind of efficiently and accessibly move through your content without, without kind of um, weighing them down with content that just doesn't feel relevant. So there's a lot of things that we can do from a layout standpoint that can help move the reader along that's in supplement, you know, supplements what you're writing about as well. And I think a lot of times as authors, we're more focused on just getting it written that we can't really even think about what the visual of it might look like later, but just know that almost anything is possible. I don't, don't the, that's all going to be done not, not only for the layout, but also even for the writing content. We can keep a broader audience in mind, but, you know, it might be laid out in a certain way that allows for that. Absolutely. We just don't want to say, I want to market to every um, every white male in the United States. That is right. not helpful, right? Like it's right. got to be some, right. it's got to be people who are at least on their radar that they're trying to do this type of work that you're writing yeah. about. Because it's yeah. kind of that adage of, you don't want to, you want to, you don't want to preach to the choir, but you also don't want to be trying to convince somebody to like drag them along the way. You want to kind of 
reach to someone who's already moderately convinced about what you're writing about and you just need to take them across the finish line for whatever that thing is. And so from a marketing standpoint, a lot of times the conversation is, you know, really nail, like really drive in home exactly who you're writing for, but at the same time or who you're marketing to, it is equally important to repel people who are not your target, right? Like your target market, your target audience, your target client, whomever that might be. It's just as important to repel as it is to attract. And I think we focus so much energy on the attraction that we don't even think about like, well, I, I want to make sure that everyone feels included by this. You know, like for those of you who are writing about gender and LGBTQ topics, there's going to be people who are very much opposed to that conversation. You don't want them anyway. That's not the person that you're going to try to attract unless you're doing some very different type of advocacy, advocacy work. And that's part of your, your bigger goal, which is why understanding your goals, your objectives, and like really figuring this out. So we want to kind of like bring the people who are already interested and get them where we want them to go rather than trying to convince somebody that will just never budge. You know, we could use political examples here. There's people that will just never budge. We don't want to, we don't want to be trying to, to be in that game. We want to just really resonate with people who are already there. All right. So Esther saying is so true. It's a waste of time. Absolutely is. No, I'm saying it on. Did I just, was that Sharon? Did I just accidentally I just click the button? Somebody unmuted and I think I just muted you unintentionally. No? Okay. I'll keep going. And if I did, I apologize. You can come back on. Okay. Technology and I are really, we're off to the races today. <laughs> All right. So now we can talk about demographic data. Again, I think this is one of the easier ones to think about. So for many of you writing, this is already a relevant conversation point. So, you know, what's their sexual orientation or gender identity? What's their education level? Their occupation or employment? Are they married? Do they have kids? How about religion, religious affiliations? What about generations? Again, for some of you, this is going to be relevant. For others, it won't be relevant. And for some of you, it might be like all of them are relevant or just one piece of here is relevant. It is okay. It really just depends on where you are at and who you are writing for. So curious in the chat, what's your demographic data? What does that look like for those that you are reaching out to? Uh, Carlton is saying targeting readers sounds a little like project management stakeholder analysis. Yeah, I don't know how that exactly is defined, but yes, it's really just kind of understanding who who you are you are reaching out to and yes you could think about a reader as a stakeholder for sure there's a lot of different words we can kind of swap out for readers in this case you're writing books so readers are, are who we're trying to reach mine would be queer or open-minded not sure the rest matters absolutely like the, the person who had posted before about um being moms um and there was a faith-based component to that like that really helps it really helps nail down who you are writing for Married women, probably with some religion, middle education, adults. So we could probably go even deeper on that, Terry. And we're going to get to we're going to get to that depth when we think about behavioral and psychographic data too. So it's all going to kind of build on itself. And what my hope is for all of this information is that it helps you just think about who you're writing for in a more three dimensional type of way. So instead of just sitting here thinking like, okay, I'm writing for women, or I'm writing for middle aged women, or I'm writing for a woman with a child. What does that really look like? Because if we think about the stories and the examples that we might share, if you are writing a book, and we had, uh, we had a book that we worked on a while back that the goal was to be reaching women as an audience, but all of the examples in the book were men. That is not aligned. That is not actually helping move us forward. So we have to like really be adding that lens of critical thinking on top of what we're writing. And so we're able to say like, all right, Love what you're up to. These are great stories and great examples. But if your goal is to reach women and empower them, sharing a bunch of stories about men is not going to be the way to get there. We want to be thinking about diversity, right? We want to be thinking about, like, is there, you know, is there an equal balance of stories being shared based on gender or sexual orientation or race or whatever, whatever the, 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 that marker might look like? And that's fine, but it just has to be relevant for your topic and who you're writing for. Uh, Samantha is saying women... Education level, probably college. Occupation doesn't marry. Probably married with kids. No religious preference. 25 years old. Great starting point. So we're going to build on that. We're going to build on that in this, this next piece. Everybody good with the demographic side of things? Yes. Check. Makes sense. We're good. Okay. 
All right. Psychographic. The best way to summarize psychographic data is just how people tick. What makes them do what they do? Not what are they doing, but what makes them do what they do? So lifestyles. You know, we could be thinking about someone who has a really active lifestyle, someone who has a really healthy lifestyle, someone who has a sedentary lifestyle. Lifestyle can be defined in a lot of different ways. Social class, lower, middle, upper. Again, sometimes this is relevant, sometimes it's not relevant. Health. I think health can be a thing. If you were writing a, bu a book about chronic um, illness, the health of your readers is going to be really important, right? We have someone in our, in our writing program currently right now who's writing about uh, chronic, living with chronic conditions. For her, she's reaching people who specifically have chronic conditions and are trying to just live a better life in spite of them. So that matters to her. My book, completely irrelevant. Background or upbringing. You know, like, is there, like, are you writing a book that has trauma, whether it's capital T trauma or little t trauma? Is a traumatic, you know, a, chi a traumatic childhood experience somehow relevant to what you're writing about? What are their goals or beliefs or habits, right? Values, attitudes toward things. You know, like, thinking about something like politics, like, politics kind of fits in, in both camps, right? Like, a little bit because, you know, in some ways, Politics drives a lot of a lot of ways in which we show up. So that could be something that we throw in here too that might fall under kind of values and attitudes. Um, the woman who's coming out of human trafficking or other similar violent environments. Yeah, Jasmine, that's a that's a that's a big one. And that all of this would matter, right? Like that is that is big T trauma. And so if you're trying to be part of a, a movement to help more get more women out of those situations, writing to the people who are somehow orbiting that person. So that's kind of what we have to think about too, is that sometimes, and I don't want to confuse and complicate things, but sometimes who the target reader is, isn't necessarily the person that we are targeting as a buyer of the book. So sometimes it might be that you know you're part of a we'll use the the human trafficking right so it could be someone who's part of a an organization that is really doing everything they can to kind of fight against that and it might be the organization is writing for the and i feel like ally is not the right word for the advocates for the people who are out there doing the the work but it might not be that organization that's buying that book it might be you know it might be someone who saw a documentary somewhere and was like, I want to just kind of educate other people around me. And I want to, I want to be able to kind of hand this book out. A better example, a more clear, concise example would be, there is the, the book called Who Moved My Cheese? If anyone's been in corporate environments, we've all been handed that book. Um, a classic. But as a, like, I remember when I was 23 and had a, a desk job for the first time, I was given that book by the CEO. I was the intended reader of that book, but I was absolutely not the buyer of that book. So sometimes that is a relevant lens to think about too. So are you reaching executives or management who are going to buy this book to give to other people? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. All just kind of depends. Sometimes it can be both. So we can kind of be doing, it's like a top down and a bottom up type of approach. We're actually, I had a conversation with one of our authors that, uh, earlier today, and we were talking about kind of reaching executives. And so it's either you might want to market to the individual person who can then bring that content and information to their management that might be able to hire that author to come in and do, you know, do some kind of additional work, speaking, consulting, whatever it might be. Or sometimes it is the organization that already brought that person in and now they're handing out the books to those individual people. So still kind of all the same people, it's just different directions in which we're reaching them. Does that make sense? So much nuance, so many layers here. Who wants to throw in any additional insights? Some of you have a really, I think, a good sense of who the, the, the psychographic data. Like, so Samantha, you're saying middle, upper class, poor health, mainly caused by stress, trauma-filled past, goal is to change their life, overcome stress, PTSD, anxiety, and sick of being on medication to manage it and open-minded. That is perfect. Because now when we're thinking about you writing this book for someone, you can have all of those factors in mind for somebody. So I think I used this as an example yesterday about chronic 
um, chronic um, disorganization and may or may or may not have. Um, but like, it's the same kind of idea, right? Like if you're trying to reach somebody that's at a very, um, like a, a very pivotal place, we have to think about how we're delivering that information to them. So someone who is looking for that kind of transformation to get them out of that chronic stress place, how do we reach them? And how do we create a book that isn't going to create more stress for them? You know, sometimes just the act of reading a book is stressful to people. So that's when we start to think about formats. Is it print? Is it digital? Is it audio? There's different formats. For some people, purchasing your book might be too much of a too much of an investment, right? Sometimes we have readers where they, they just can't afford to buy the book. And so what is the plan for that when that happens? Is it that you have some content that's on your website that provides a lot of information already and then the hope is that they get that content and they're like, you know what? I am willing to make that investment in myself by buying this book. Sometimes, that, again, everything is like, sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's not. Angela, I would love to write to the male audience and open their minds to embracing women leaders without offending. Something really simple but impactful. Yeah, Angela, I think that's fantastic. So in your case, it'd be all about tone, right? Because if we come in to a, a book that is, that is the topic and we are male bashing and saying you are bad and you are wrong for any of these reasons, no one's going to listen to you, right? So it's like, how do you kind of come in with the intention in mind and get their buy-in? to then get the buy-in of helping support women, right? So like there's a lot of different kind of factors to all of this. What was the other one I saw? I don't know how to write my book. Um, suburban straight moms with religious convictions who love their LGBTQ child more than love the church. That is minimizing that child's experience. Yeah, I think Sandy, you are onto something. We have a number of authors who have written in this, in this vein. So if, happy to provide resources for their books. Nikki, I'm thinking of Chris and Midge in particular, um, if you want to at some point drop those links. Um, so this is, can we see how psychographic data is just really adding, like adding a lens to this that just makes it easier to understand who exactly you're writing for? All right. And then behavioral, I feel like it's a little more straightforward in the word behavioral, but you know, what, what occasions are important to your readers? You know, are they loyal are they like a fan of like a, a genre, right? It could even be, we could use loyal, like are they a diehard Pittsburgh Steelers fan? Just a random team. That might matter, right? Like if you were writing a book that somehow that is a piece of it, it might matter. What are, like what motivates them, right? So if we think about marketing, marketing is two, two angles. You're either providing something pleasurable or you're avoiding pain. Those are kind of the two things that we can apply almost every product that is marketed to us as human beings. It's either pleasure or pain. Most of the time in my experience, especially with nonfiction books, is that we are solving a problem. So we are solving a pain point with a, with a nonfiction book. If you are writing a memoir, it could be both pleasure or pain, depending. If you are writing fiction, it's going to be mostly pleasure, right? It's going to be someone who they're just a voracious fiction reader and they can't wait to get the latest book on whatever, whatever genre that happens to be. That's somebody who is just seeking that out because they just want more of it. But with what we're all up to, most of us, I want to make assumptions, but most of us are solving some kind of problem here. So what is motivating them to solve that problem? What is that threshold that they hit where the pain is just too hard to deal with that they have to take some kind of action? Where are they in terms of their readiness? This says readiness to buy, but it's readiness to take action. And where are they in their journey in coming across you and what you're writing about? And their willingness to kind of say, all right, enough is enough. I have to do something about this particular problem. So if we're thinking about books that are related to, to health and diet and wellness and things like that, what is that breaking point that someone might hit to say, I can't live like this anymore. I have to go do this thing. Or what type of problem might be occurring in a workplace where it's, I finally got to the place where my manager is so toxic that I just can't, I just can't go forward anymore. And now they're, they're about to quit their job and your book is a solution to help them figure out how to navigate a new environment. What are their buying patterns? 
right? Like, are we impulse buying here? I just impulse bought a fiction book at the airport because my phone charger was giving me hell and I didn't want to buy a phone charger. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to buy a book. Complete impulse buy. And that's what airport bookstores are good for. But is it someone who's researching and like really doing a lot of homework, a lot of digging around your topic to then finally stumble upon your book and be like, oh my God, I've been looking for this book, right? There's a number of you that are writing books that I think that is exactly what's going to happen. Someone just stumbles across and they're like, oh my God, that's exactly what I've been looking for. I didn't even know I was looking for that. There it is. And Jess is asking, what, what would motivation look like for someone buying a memoir? I think that can be pleasure and it can be pain. It really just kind of depends on what the topic of the memoir is. So if I look at my memoir that I wrote in 2020, that is a whole can of worms unto itself, but it was very much sharing my story about a very specific thing, very trauma related, that made other people feel seen and heard because it's such a small percentage of the population impacted. And so just to help people feel seen and heard. It is not a, it is not a leisure read, I can tell you that for a fact. But there are other memoirs, and I don't know if I can think of one specifically as an example, but there's other memoirs where it is complete leisure. Right? Just like, a, oh, I can't wait to read this. What's the, um, Mickey, who's the one that just came out with that monster that's like 900 pages? Someone, someone's going to know the celebrity. I don't want to say Dolly Parton, but it's somebody. Bar um, thank you, Vicky. Jesus, thank you. Vicky. Uh, Barbara nice. Streisand, right? That is going to be a leisurely 900 page read. Because it's Babs. You can't, you know, she can get away with writing a book that long. None, none of us else can, just as an FYI. That is, that is obscene okay. and ridiculous. Um, but so just like, and in your case, kind of what you're working on, I would put yours more in like the pleasure bucket, right? Where it's someone who's just like interested in like your, because it's like, like you have an interesting kind of like configuration. And so it's like just someone who's like interested and there's like a recipe type of component to it and like, that's fun, right? If we think about someone who might be writing just a strict cookbook, that's going to be something that's pleasurable, right? Like, or it could be the opposite. It could be solving a problem where it's someone who's writing a gluten-free recipe book. That's solving a problem. Whereas someone who's writing like how to indulge yourself with as much butter as possible, that might be a pleasure cookbook, right? So just kind of depends. And then, you know, where and how are they reading, right? So like, what is their, what is, what do their habits look like? If I think about myself as a reader and I think about my habits, I will read fiction on a Kindle. I will read nonfiction in print and I will listen to a memoir. But I don't really, I try not to listen to nonfiction because I just, I need to see it while I'm trying to do the thing. And I absolutely have no interest in having like print fiction books, which with the exception of my impulse purchase at the airport last week. Right, so we all make kind of like outlier decisions. So this is important to think about from what, what type of book are we gonna put out? Most of the time when people think about publishing their book, they're thinking about doing it in print. And you know, what, if you're doing it in print, doing it in digital is very easy. It's just they're hand in hand. Audiobooks, on the other hand, requires extra effort. But are your people going to be people who are not going to physically pick up a book and read, but they'll listen to a book? It's something important to know. And it's not to say you wouldn't want to have those other formats, but it's just, it's an important thing to know which, where do you want to kind of put your priority? And at this point, you may have absolutely no idea, and that's 100% fine, right? Because everyone does have different types of reading preferences. Is this... Jen, oh, yeah, let's go for it. Sorry, there was a question that I don't think you addressed yet from Monique. How would you target a reader who doesn't know they need the help yet? For example, how to navigate the holidays or after you get divorced? Oh, that's a really good one. So... Here's where I think the buyer and reader might be a little bit different. There might be somebody who stumbles across this topic and they're like, oh, wow. Like, I wouldn't even have thought, how, like, you know, like, this is something that I, I'm struggling with, but I didn't even realize I was struggling with it. So you might create an aha moment for somebody. But your potential buyer of the book might be the people who are orbiting that newly divorced person. So it could be the sister, the brother, the the former in-law, the whomever it might be, who might be somehow orbiting that person to say, you know, I know that you just recently got divorced and, you know, I'm so sorry. I know the holidays can be a little bit difficult, but I came across this book. I think it would be something that would be, that you might benefit from. 
And if we want to get really strategic and thinking about marketing, so that's what that's what we focus our energies on all day, every day when we think about books and is the marketing aspect of it. It could be how do you get your book in front of divorce attorneys? And now divorce attorneys are the people who are providing that book to their clients upon their official divorce. Then your focus is marketing to them as well as the people orbiting the divorce, the, the person who just got divorced, as well as the divorcee, right? So it's almost like three different people that you're potentially marketing to. You're still writing the book toward that person who just got divorced, who's struggling with the holidays. But from a marketing standpoint, we're broadening it to have different verticals in which we're trying to reach other people that might be orbiting that person. Does that help? Makes so much sense. Awesome. That is the goal. Uh, would it be helpful to also list out similar books to your own topic that are already published? Yes, that, that is never a bad idea. I actually had a conversation with somebody today, and that was like her primary question was competitive research and understanding, mm -hmm. like, does she need to have that information coming to the table and working with us? And it's like, if you do, great. If you don't, we'll help you figure it out, right? Like, it's not, uh, it's not a one size fits all. But I think it helps you figure out where you're going to position your book into the market. And this is where books can, you know, sometimes books fail or just don't do well is because they're confusing to a reader. So this happens more, I think, in fiction. So if you have, I don't even really think I can come up with a good example, but if you have some kind of sci-fi romance fantasy book, those are three different genres. Who are you actually reaching? Because a sci-fi person probably could care less about romance. A romance person could care less about sci-fi. We're not doing cozy mystery. So there's like all of these different confusing messages. So even though it sounds like a good idea, unless there's a carved out market, especially from a fiction standpoint, it is really hard to kind of reach them. So we want to be thinking about what does that look like for us? What are other books that are similar that are kind of in this space? And how do we, how do we, how do we use that as a comparison point from how do we price it? Where are they marketing it? What categories is that, is that book showing up in? And is that a category your book belongs in? And that can create a whole rabbit hole onto itself. So there's a lot of different ways in different directions that we can do this. And someone also asked about the most popular way to consume a book and assume the most popular format that we see generalizations but when it comes to nonfiction books it's typically paperback that seems to be mm -hmm. what's and when it's fiction fiction books or ebooks those are the two kind of things and if we look at just with historical data as a company paperback books outsell hardcovers by by a significant mm -hmm. significant uh, distance but there are going to be people that you know might want a hardcover book but paperbacks are kind of the kind of the jam. By default, we publish all of our books in paperback and hardcover and ebook. And unless someone just specifically doesn't want one of those versions for whatever reason, we make an exception. But it just allows us to kind of treat them a little bit differently from a distribution standpoint. And just kind of broadens the opportunity because if someone really wants to have a special edition hardcover, some type of, you know, some type of experience, they'll pay the premium for that. And then other people are going to be like, I don't care. I'm just going to get the paperback. <laughs> Everyone's a little bit different. And, you know, you could put a survey out to your people and to say, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about writing a book, just trying to do some research here and figure out exactly what I'm, what I'm doing here. Can you answer these three questions and just see what people say? That way you're not kind of just doing it without any intentionality, which ask. And then it, the benefit of that, it gets people interested. I'm like, Oh, wow. I have like, she's, you know, they're working on a book. Now I need to know what that's about. And it starts to kind of bring people along the journey with you while you're writing it because one of the, the biggest mistakes that I see people make is that they wait until the book is published before they start marketing it when really you should be marketing it and talking about it now while it's still an idea which is very scary to do because then it traps you into actually delivering on this promise that you have made to other people it is in the very first chapter of my book I have something that's like you know tag me on social media when you make your declarative post to say that you're doing this thing. Like, I know it's scary. You can blame me. You can say whatever you want about me in it, but just go for it because like, it's scary. But the benefit is that every person that you collect along the way, who's like, Ooh, I cannot wait until Samantha's book comes out. Can't wait until Marlene's book comes out. You can just track those people in a very simple spreadsheet or in a document or on your phone, wherever to then be able to go out to them later to say, 
I finally did the thing and I'm so happy that you were there at the start with me to support me. It just helps build your tribe and your community of readers later. And the wonderful thing we'd love to see is that people have actually reached out to let us know. They do drop us an email to say that they are writing their book. So it's been really great to be a part to connect with writers that we wouldn't have connected with. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it hopefully inspired them in some way. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's, that is the goal. So I see Monique is asking regarding audiobook option, would it be a good strategy to connect more personally with your target market by doing a few topics as a podcast? That is a beautiful strategy. Doing podcasts are a significantly less labor intensive way of doing this. And the beautiful thing about audiobooks and podcasts is that you get a different connection with somebody because you're hearing their voice, you're hearing their personality, the inflection, their tone, which you don't always get on the page. And so there's a, a high kind of, uh, I don't want to say a conversion, but there's a high engagement when there's a podcast and a kind of a book that goes with it. And sometimes someone might not do an audiobook, but they'll create a, like a short series of podcasts that go with the book. So you have 10 chapters in your book. You're going to do a 10 episode special, right? You're just going to do a special series. That's only 10 episodes. That way you're not committing yourself to having an ongoing podcast that will go on and on and on forever. Um, and then someone asked about um, a special edition of the hardcover, which you have actually done. Yeah. So <clears throat> it just kind of depends on the goals. So like, what is the, what is the goal of what we're doing? And so for me, I have a special edition hardcover that's in full color signed with a bookmark that is available through our mm -hmm. website. If you go to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere else, you could only get the black and white paperback. And the cost difference between these two are dramatic in terms of print costs. Like one's like $17, one's $4. Like it is like a dramatic uh, difference between the two. But when someone comes to our website and purchases the book, then we get to see who that person is. And I can personally interact with them to say, hey, thank you so much for buying the book. It's in the mail. Um, you know, if you have any questions after reading it, let me know, you know, let, let us know um, what's going on. Just by being in color, for me, what I wanted to do is I wanted to show people what's possible. Because I think so often when we think about nonfiction books, we just think black and white. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with a standard black and white nonfiction book. Not at all. They're great. That's why they're best practices, right? But I wanted people to visually see what the potential is. And so I have that as the special edition on the website. And you know, you can go look at the paperback version. It's still, in my opinion, I think it still looks great, but the color edition just is a different experience. And so for someone who's kind of looking for that different experience, they're welcome to go check it out. But there's no, um, you know, it's all the same content at the end of the day. Um, as a publisher, your color version is excellent marketing. Thank you, Cindy. I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I have to like up my game because I have to have to show those that we work with, like what you can do here. And I think that's just a really important thing in my memoir, which maybe I'll show it tomorrow because it requires me to dig down in my bookcase and I don't know exactly where it is. But um, my memoir actually has it's called House on Fire and it actually has flames along the side of the of the edges of the book. So when you turn the spine, it looks like it's on fire. It is. Um, and that was like, if I'm going to do a memoir, I can't be a publisher and not up the game somehow, right? Like I can't just put out a subpar product if I'm helping other people put out their books. Oh, Nikki has it. So if you like fan the, um, let me see if I can pin you for a second. Will I be able to, pin? I can pin you. Can you see it? Did that work? <laughs> yeah. Right. Looks so cool. The edge. It's like, I just got to up the game somehow. I got to add a little, a little, but that's yeah. also a special edition, right? So the hardcover is in color with the flames and the paperback is black and white, right? So it's just different ways to do this. Um, and that is all math, by the way, if anyone's curious. And I had nothing to do with it because math is not my strength, but it is all <laughs> a math equation that a very brilliant designer created. Uh, okay, so Esther's saying, I'm thinking I'd love to do some embossing and foil blocking. Absolutely. Sky's the limit when it comes to what the potentials are. It's just a matter of how much are we willing to pay for all the bells and whistles that we want to put on the creation of what the book looks like. Because the mm -hmm. hardcover, like I said, it's like a $4 difference versus, $4 versus like $17. It's a big difference. So your profitability is dramatically reduced. But again, for me, my focus isn't necessarily selling the book. It's more about, it's more about just showing the potential of what a book can look like. If my goal were specifically sales, I would be doing the black and white paperback all day long, or even the ebook. 
Uh, Sandy, are you offering attendees a signed copy of your color book? How much, Nikki, if you can drop the link into the book, um, the sure book page, so. we can absolutely put that in there for you. We are raffling. Actually, I think that might be might be the next slide as we're getting here. Yeah, we do have five minutes left. I just want to mention that um, to squeeze in all the goodies before we help off. I know. I like to, I like to rush <laughs> to the last minute here. Um, <laughs> just three simple tips when we're thinking about this when we're thinking about our target readers again ask questions i already said that like ask your people find comparable books we talked about that and just search the internet if you're just trying to figure out like who my target people are the best example i can give is if you're writing a book about caregiving for example and you're trying to figure out like what are caregiver statistics go to go to a place like aarp because they're going to have some kind of marketing section on their website that's going to give data points about who their target readership is because there's probably a high likelihood that readers of that and caregiving are kind of going hand in hand, right? So just try to find something that's comparable and that's something that we can do uh, by searching the internet. Um, all right, so we already announced the winner. So very excited. We will send that out this week. If you want to throw your hat in the ring today, every day it's a different, like different entry. So please want to kind of like uh, mm -hmm. prioritize those that are here live. So throw it into the mix and Tom, um, um, yeah. Esther, we do do print on demand, but you can get them batch printed as well. Um, and then Jen, um, there's a couple of questions about how do books sell these days? Um, and do we sell thousands, hundreds, eBooks, audiobooks, et cetera? That is a moving target that is kind of like up and down all the time. Like, so there's uh, an organization called Publishers Weekly and they will often kind of put out like what the print sales are from like the previous period, the last year, this, that, and the other. And the print sales seem to be going back up, but they, when they go down, it's only by like a percent, like it's not like anything significant. And, you know, there was this belief that like the sky was falling once upon a time, that like eBooks are here, that print books will go away. They're not, I, I just, I don't see a scenario in which print books will, will really ever completely go away, but for your audience, they may be. So that's why we have to think about who we're writing for. If you were writing for young people, for example, 20 year olds and under, Having something digital or even audio version is probably going to be better than having something print because their their style is not picking up print books, right? So it kind of like we've got to look at the the specific slices of those uh, demographics. I think that is all of the things I had for today. We have two minutes. If there's other questions that are popping up, I think Tom I saw saw one here. Um, my question above aligns with Cindy's. Oh yeah, do many books sell nowadays? Um, yeah, it is like, Nikki, you're the one who knows our numbers from a, mm -hmm. from a data standpoint. I feel like it's like paperback over hardcover, like 10 to one, but I don't really know where eBooks fall in. in terms mm -hmm. of it's typically paperbacks, eBooks, hardcover, and then and audio. If an author does one, it's typically low on the list as well. Yeah. And again, it just depends on who you're writing for. So for some people having that audio book is going to be imperative for others, they might, mm -hmm. they might not be necessary. Having a and, and a clear <laughs> marketing strategy also helps. <laughs> so once you narrow in on those things, it helps. Mm -hmm. I'm, wondering, I'm wondering Cindy's question might be lined also, like if you're gonna put the money in to work with an editor and you know, all these things that might really add up for costs, like can you ever expect to potentially even recover your costs? Is that not very common to do so? That is the goal. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, that is always the goal. So Nikki, if we, I don't know if you can grab it fast enough, or uh, we can put it in the follow-up email. Um, there is sure. a chapter in my book that's called uh, Publishing Costs. We can drop the link for that. It's just a free download for just that chapter. It kind of gives you a whole way to think about the cost and then the return on those costs. So mm -hmm. it kind of breaks down things uh, pretty simply for what should you pay, be paying for what kind of part of the process. And um, what I know is that usually it takes about 1500 sales. If you're doing it in person at a conference on your website, about 1500 books sold will recoup your entire investment. So it's not a huge number. And I think a lot of times people think it has to be like this extraordinarily high number, but it really doesn't have to be. And with the right marketing strategy and distribution strategy, that number is pretty easy to get to. All right. So those questions that we have at the end, because we're at the top of the hour, I want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time. We can put a hold on and cover those in tomorrow's conversation. And so tomorrow we're going to be talking about uh, free writing, 
that is a very easy conversation. So tomorrow, whatever questions you have on your mind, bring them. We'll have plenty of time for questions. Sound good? We all um, feeling good? All right. Make notes of your questions. We'll screenshot these final ones that uh, that we missed today because I see accessibility. I love talking about accessibility, so we'll talk about that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Thank you, everyone, for being here. We'll announce the winner tomorrow for the, the free giveaway, and I appreciate your time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.